But luckily, we have a very uh, talented young scientist from Madrid here. And uh, we just discussed uh, the result of last night between Barcelona and Madrid. And I hope he's not too angry at me and will focus on his presentation only. He listens to the beautiful name of Miguel Luengoros. Let's have a warm applause for Miguel Luengoros. Thank you. The mic is yours. Thank you. So, good afternoon and thanks for coming. I hope that this presentation inspires you. It's the end of, it's not the end, but it's, we have been working on that for more than six years. So, let's chat about life. Okay, so because no matter how we are, it happens that we all came from a bunch of cells. Okay, we are at the beginning, we are all the same. So here we are seeing nine months in kind of 30 seconds. Uh, we can zoom here and we see uh, this reverse development, how a human embryo develops. Okay, at the end we are a bunch of cells. So here cells are moving back, back. This outlier of cells is the placenta. And here we are navigating, this is the, the f it's going to be the seagoat. And before that, we all know the story. Okay? So, what happens is that we are all composed by cells, by tissues, forms organs, and goes to form individuals. Okay? And the question is how the hell from a single cell, the seagoat, we develop into a complex organism which is organized? in organs, in cells, and, and it works. So what happens with the program of life? So the point is that in the last decade, there are new technologies that allows us to understand, to see how this happens. So let's start. OK, I present you the zebrafish. So we can't manipulate human embryos, so we use animal models, like the monkey or the rats. And it happens that to study development, the zebrafish is a very nice animal. The, the fish is a vertebrate. Uh, it shares with humans 80% of the genome. I mean, it has a backbone. So it's very similar to humans. It's very cheap. We can breed in labs. We have thousands of zebrafish like that. We have tools to modify the, the genome. We can do genetic engineering with the zebrafish. And it's a quite nice animal model. The good thing also is that it develops in 24 hours. You have an adult zebrafish, which contains more than 10,000 cells. And at the beginning, it's transparent. That means that the melanin takes time to, uh, the pigment takes time to, to go to the fish. So as it's transparent, we can do a lot of things. OK, this is, I'm going to show you a video of the, the early life of a zebrafish. The number is the minutes of life these two blobs are the first two cells of development. And the blob under the two smalls is the food, okay? In the humans, we are connected to our mother. In fish, you have this blob with the food. So let's start development. As you will see, cells start to divide, two, four, eight, whatever. So let's go. Okay, half an hour, you have 16 cells. Go, go, go. Now three hours you have 1,000 cells, and still they are all almost the same. So now, some cells are starting to go to move, okay? And are starting to make the head and the eye. This, this part of development is called gastrulation, and someone said that this is, more important, this is the more important moment in your life. It's more important than your marriage or whatever. I mean, because here you're going to make your head. So let's go. Now, they are starting to move, okay? And to eat the food, and up, in, up there, we can see the, the eye. Hey. This is the eye. Okay, this is the backbone. And this is how biology has been made for the last 30 years. Okay, this video has 30, 40 years. It's an optical microscope. Here, still a little bit. Okay. So the point is the zebrafish is a good animal model, okay? Here we're speaking about biology, but the good thing now is that we can mix different disciplines. So let's go for the next one. The next one is the green revolution. Why? So nothing to do with politics or green whatever. 
uh, Jules Verne already said in, the, in this book that they saw fluorescent jellyfish under the sea. Okay? And the point is that the jellyfish, they are fluorescent under the sea. And they are fluorescent because they have a green fluorescent protein that makes them make light. Okay? So what some scientists don't have done, and they got this Nobel Prize, is that they were able to isolate the protein that makes light. So now you can take your fish, put this piece of genome inside the genome of the zebra fish, and when you push with light, the zebra fish will be fluorescent. Okay? In fact, you can make a lot of fluorescent animals. Even there is a pig or a monkey. Okay, so this piece was genetic engineering, chemistry. Now there is another piece, which is engineering, which is these marvelous microscopes. I mean, this, this, uh, this is a nature cover two or three years ago. So now the technology of my, the optics technology is evolving very, very fast. And what happened is that we may have a microscope that has a laser that points to the cell. The cell has this green first and protein and gives light back, okay? So the idea is that you excite with a wavelet and the, and the cell reports back the light, the fluorescent light. So something like that. Okay, here we have our microscope. We are putting the light inside the embryo. Our embryo are gonna give us this fluorescent light that we are going to capture, okay? And we are going to convert it into digital signals. So now we are passing from classical biology to really having data files. We are converting these images into large data files. And the point is that you can move the laser, okay, ba, ba, ba. so you make 3D volumes as the embryo develops. So each minute, you can take an image. So now these three things, okay, we have optics engineering, we have biology, we have chemistry, these produce digital data. So I'm going to show you now this, uh, a video which is similar to the classical video we saw before, but this time made with this new technologies, okay? So we published it in 2010, and this is development. Again, in the middle we have the food, but now we see very well. We have the first two cells, four cells, and we can see how they divide and how they develop. And even if this is a 2D projection, we have the, th the whole 3D volume that is going on time, okay? So now we can start to think, okay, can we quantify biology? Can we digitize the things? I mean, can we make a Google Maps of the embryo? So this is the question. Once we are here, now it's maths and computer science. I mean, if software, you have to analyze all this data. We are speaking about images with 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 voxels, and you take one each minute, that makes about a terabyte, okay? So each of the acquisitions is a terabyte. And now, as we, I, was thinking, I was saying before, okay, Let's, uh, let's think about how we can quantify. For this, can we make an analogy? Okay, which is the plan of, of embryogenesis? When an architect makes something, first make the sketch. Okay, these are the ideas. Then make the maps or the plan. Okay, this is more, you have the measures, you know what is that. Even you can pass the map to AutoCAD or whatever. So you have in your computer. Uh, and then you build the building. And now? What we're thinking here is doing the reverse engineering. We have the photos, like the photo of the building, and we want to come back, digitize, make the plans, measure what is in its, uh, measure what is its cell, and come back to know which are the rules of this embryogenesis. What is the plan, okay? And if we do that, I mean, we can make the digital embryo. Okay, this is another video showing this time uh, from the top, the embryo, and we cut. Here we can see, again, the backbone. And the thing is that we have modified the fish this time. So we can see in green the cell nuclei, and in orange the membranes. So now we have these films with membranes and nuclei. So which is the first step to digitize the embryo? We can say, OK, let's take a 2D image, just a cross-section and find the XY position. This for each cell, so we can have like the address. Okay, each cell has an address. This simple mathematics, let's say, the idea is that if this is the, the image, you can see like, a, like, like, like mountains and the intensity maxima 
are going to be ourselves. Okay, so we can find the maxima, and each of the maxima is going to give the position of one of the cells. But we can go a step further because we have the 3D data. So let's find the X, Y, Z position, the address of each of the cells. We can go a step further because we have the time. Okay, so now is okay. We find the cell in one moment and we see where the cell is going. Okay, so we can track cells. We make the we make the acquisition, we get the, make the film, and then we can track each the development of each of the cells. So here we see one video, okay, we have detected all the cells, okay, and we're going to follow this cell, to track this cell during development. We want to see where it started and where it's going to finish. Maybe it's going to be part of the eye or of the heart. We don't know. This, I mean, we have to unveil where this cell is going. I think that now it's going to divide each of the frames that you are seeing now, each one minute of life. So we are tracking this cell for, I think it's about 10 hours. Now it divides. Eh? This is the descendants. The And another simple explanation to find that in the data, how you do this pattern recognition. Okay, we have 3D plus time data sets. So if you think one dimension is a line, two dimensions is a square, three dimensions is a cube, and four dimensions is a hypercube. That means a cell in four dimensions is like a, a, a cell that moves, a tube that moves, okay? So we made a computer program that recognize hypertubes in this four-dimensional image. And the same way you did with one cell, you can track all the cells of the embryo. So here, they are all moving together to form the backbone. I have to say that we also develop at home all the software for visualization that allows to see all the, make these movies. This is done with uh, processing. So here, we have all the coordinates of all the cells of the embryo and where are they going? But, as we said before, we have also the membranes. So let's add another dimension. Let's add the shape. We want to give to each cell, to each address, we want to give also the shape of the cell, okay? And for that, we also need computer science, and we need the, to treat, to process these images to find the shape which is associated with each one of the cells. So now, as we see in this picture, we have all the evolution, so we have all the shape, all the positions, and all the lineage tree of all the cells of the embryo. Okay, we can make a video, and we see this is the first cell, the same thing that we saw at the beginning with the classical microscopy, but now it's completely digital. Okay, it's completely digitized. So here we go from the first cell to 1,000 cells. We can go again a step further. And now we are going to include uh, genetics. So it happens that uh, the same way that we can tag the nuclei and the membranes, we can introduce this fluorescent protein in the genome just close to a gene, when a gene express. You know, we have the DNA. The DNA, DNA has all the instructions of what a cell has to do, and we put a small piece of, of green protein in the genome of the fish just close to the gene we want to understand, okay? So when a cell is gonna use this gene, we're going to see it. So it's, and I mean, and, and this is what happens during, during development is that uh, there is like a orchestra of all the genes. All parts of the embryo express one gene and the other, and these genes are related to functions. Okay? In fact, uh, when we say we have a, a genetic illness or whatever, is that this gene doesn't work very well. And we can even make an, uh, a test and say, okay, you don't have this gene, or you have this gene two or three times. Here, what we want to see is when this gene, is not the output of this gene. I mean, I have diabetes. It's we, we want to see when this gene is acting. Okay? And we can also have the genes. So this is the raw data. This time we have the gene in green and the cells in orange. Okay, so here uh, we are seeing all the cells, all the nuclei, and in green we are seeing the cells that express a gene whose function is to prepare the brain or is, is in controls the brain and the head. 
and which image processing again, we can uh, find the region and count the number of cells that are expressed in this gene. So here, these are the cells that are expressed in this gene. You, we can count them and see where they go or where they come from. Again, this is another kind of representation where the red cells show uh, the ones that are expressed in the gene. So, and I mean, and now with this kind of overview representations, we can check for different properties. We can try to correlate the speed of the cells with the gene expression, the shape of the cells with the gene expression. And remember that we have the tree. So we can say, okay, this cell at the beginning uh, became the eye. Or there was a moment where you, this cell split in two, and one go to the left eye, and the other went to the right eye. So the point is that in the future, this is not today, ni, ni five years or 10 years, maybe 20 years, in the future, we will be able to reconstruct the whole genome, okay? So this is like a step further. Now we are able to sequence the genome. That means they take a, a blood sample, they take the, and they give you the genome. But what if you can have the genome live? That means, for instance, when you have cancer, the cells have a corrupted genome, have a different genome. So the point is that now we are seeing this genome in a static, but in the future, we might see in dynamic life, okay? But this is just in the future. So to recap, making a project like that or doing this kind of research, which is multidisciplinary, you need, of course, biology. You need genetic engineering. But you need also optics, nanotechnology. You need data analysis, modelization, hackers, image processing, I mean, it's all data, you need pattern recognition. You need to understand what you are doing, so you need to speak close with people from other disciplines. But also you need to make visualization programs, as the one that we made it, to see all these terabytes of information. And even more important, you need to process all this data. For doing these things, uh, we were using computing resources from the CERN and the French Nuclear Agency. I mean, we have databases with millions of cells, because each one of the acquisitions is one terabyte, and uh, you have kind of one million cells, individual cell points. So you need really huge computing resources. And this is what takes making, making a project like that, more or less, okay? This is all the pieces that you need. So, so which are the applications, okay? now. We are here, we have the digital embryo, we measure everything, and, but what can you do with this? Next step. The first is obvious, I mean, you can make mathematical models, understand the system, make simulations. Okay, so here we have a prototype of what is the development, but this time is a, it's a, mat a mathematical prototype. So we average 10 different embryos, the positions, the timing of division, and uh, we produce this. So then you can try to understand these mathematical laws of nature. So now they are dividing. So each of the dipoles is a division. And you have the time of development there. But also, of course, it's imp important for the land biology. And here, there is a very, ni a very nice concept that appears all the time in biology, I mean, as we said before, there are different scales, from cells to organs, tissues, whatever. So this concept of emergence, I like this explanation, is when very small things make appear something bigger at a higher scale, okay? So cells do things like that. Each one has a small mission, but all together are doing something bigger. <laughs> Just some countries can do that. <laughs> okay, so let's see our cells. Now, came back. What we want to see in the cells is I color uh, from blue to red the time of life, okay, of this life of the first 1,000 cells. And we're going to see how there are like waves of division. Okay, so we see how there are like waves of division. So we discovered that means that cells, when they divide, they say to the other cell, hey, divide. 
Okay? So there is communication between cells that makes these waves appear. Another interesting thing is to study mutations. Because the same way we can tag the different parts of the, the cell nuclei, the membranes, we can do other kind of engineering and have mutant embryos. Okay? So for instance, we have one that is known because it generates cyclope fish. That means a fish with just one eye in the middle. Okay? And little was known about how this happened. And we saw the lineage tree. We saw that, in fact, what happens is that, okay, there are a bunch of cells that are going to make the eye. They're here. And behind them, there are the cells that are going to make the brain. And in a normal animal, a normal human or fish, the cells that are going to make the brain split in two parts the eyes. Okay, so one on the left is going to be the left eye, and one on the right is going to be the right eye. But what happens with our cyclope animal is that the brain cells didn't develop very well, so they were not strong enough to split in two the eye region. So the eyes didn't divide. So what we thought it was a cyclope fish, which is a cyclope fish, the, the main point is that they have brain problems. So we have a video. This is the development of this weird embryo, and we see that it's not symmetric. We'll see here that makes weird things, because the, it's like the brain cells didn't survive to split the, um, the eye. Another interesting thing is, okay, let's study cancer, because we can implant tumors in the fish. So if you can't implant tumors in the fish, you can see in real time what really cancer cells are doing, which in fact, usually cancer is just cells that became crazy and start to divide without following the rules. It's like, okay, they are out of the party, they don't follow the normal plan of development of whatever, and they're, they're just uh, dividing like crazy, and this makes a tumor. So you can implant tumors in the fish and see how it happens. This fish is called Casper, and uh, they, some people study with, with it uh, the skin cancer. Okay? They put the skin cancer, and they see what happens in the fish and how these cells are acting. Another example is for regenerative medicine. That means when you have a problem, when you have an infarctus, when you cut uh, something of your skin or whatever, uh, how the cells that are around are going to regenerate your tissues. Okay? And for instance, with the zebrafish, there are people in California that they study how the heart regenerates after an infarctus. Okay? And you can see which is the lineage and which are the cells, which are the characteristics of the cells that are going to fill the gap and take the place of the dead cells. So this video, which is amazing, is showing the zebrafish heart. Each of the blobs is a red blood cell inside the heart. Okay, so it's pumping, boom, boom. Let's put it again. So these are red blood cells. Another application, of course, is stem cells. As we said before, if we have the lineage, we can see in which moment a cell divided and became one thing or the other. Okay? We can trace back and, look and check where these cells came from. So in this example, each of the colors, this is like a, when the embryo has less than 1,000 cells. Okay? And each of the colors are the predecessors of an organ or a tissue. I think that the pink ones are going to give the eye. So now, here we go. They start to move. When they divide, they get the same color. Now they are moving again, gastrulation. And these two blobs are going to be to the eyes. And the brain is in red, the neural plate. OK, so you can also study stem cells. So all in all, there are a lot of applications that you can take from this kind of digital reconstruction. If we look in the future, we will still see how different technologies are evolving. Nanotechnology. We are having, with nanotechnology, you can make super good optics that allows you to see which final resolution. Biotech, genetic engineering, as we have seen, is super important so you can tag different parts of the embryo. 
artificial intelligence, I mean, you need to compute to do data processing of terabytes of information. So with these three things, in the future, as we said before, we may have these Google Maps of yourself in real time. Okay, so where you can see each of your cells, or a fish, or from a person, and you can navigate and see what is well and what is not working. Also, you can think about the language of life, because what we have seen is how things go, but what is behind? And the question is that we know DNA, okay? We know the genome is in each of the cells. It has destructions. But I mean, if most of most of you, if I give you a Chinese keyboard, even if you know the correspondence between the letters, you will not be able to understand to understand a book in Chinese. Okay, so knowing the letters is not enough. And the letters are the basis of the DNA. You know that the DNA is a chain which is always which always have one of these four letters, okay? And you have thousands of letters in a chain. So with even though we have sequenced the genome now more than 30 years ago, we don't understand how it works. We don't understand uh, for what is each of the pieces. In fact, we think that almost all the genome is rubbish, is junk, and it's, it's not clear uh, for what are all, out, of the out of the letters. So it's true that we learn that when you put together out of letters, you form genes. Okay, and we know that there are genes that has specific functions. So we are starting to, starting to understand what make each of the words. Okay, so you have, as we said before, if you have this gene, you may have more chances to have a disease. If you have this gene several times, uh, it's like there is a gene that when you, you have this gene, when you piss, and you have eaten before asparagus, you can smell it. And this is just a gene. So half of the people do, half of the people doesn't do. Okay, so there are genes that are related to some specific things, but we don't know all the genes. But why? Because also you need syntaxis. I mean, in a language, how you put the words, how they are go, they go together, how they organize. It's like in music, like in harmony. The gene regulatory networks are network of genes that are acting and switching on and off. So you can uh, have a more complex process. And now we are starting to map these relations between genes. But again, even if you know syntaxes, words, letters, probably you will not be able to fully understand a book in Chinese. You may, might need something more. This is again a zebrafish, okay? But this time we make something weird. Uh, at the beginning of development, uh, we picked some cells that we knew, we knew that they were moving and we put it in the other side of the embryo. Okay, so we just uh, during development, we take some cells and we transpose to the other part of the embryo. So what happens is that the embryo develop, develop quite well or not. It develop with two heads. Okay, so that means that the cells that we move at the beginning of development, we put them in the other place. There were cells in charge of coordinating the creation of the brain and the head and the axis. Okay, in fact, there were the same cells that we were looking before with the gene expression. Okay, so I mean, what does mean is that to understand the language, you know to understand the semantics, when and where matters. And this is the clear example. If we can understand the semantics, that means when and where, and the letters, and the gene regulatory networks, and everything, you, we might understand one day the library of life. I mean, which are the instructions for each of the organism, which in fact are very similar. As we said, the fish and the human share 80% of the genome, which are the instructions. There are nothing less. Them, there are some external factors. It's like, a, I mean, because one key question, if you go back to the beginning, is the first moment you have one cell divides in two, which are almost the same. How do you break the symmetry? Is the, I mean, why one side is going to be different to the other? Why one side is going to generate 
the head and the other the tail. So for instance, in chicken happens that the place where the sperm enters into the egg, okay, leaves uh, there is a kind of gradient of chemical substances, and when you have two cells, the cell which is closer to the place where the sperm enter into the egg is gonna is gonna react and say, okay, I have these chemical components. Let's make in this place the head, and in the other place the tail. So the point is that I mean, it's like a how to break symmetry. It's a very, I mean, it's kind of mystery, but. When and where matters, and if we understand all that, we might understand how to read the library of life. And just to finish, someone can say, okay, and what about writing? Can you write DNA? Can you code genome? What happens if you put different letters? Can you make life? So last year, the Craig Venture Institute, they make this work for the first time, they were able to write the letters of the DNA, okay, with a machine. They put together all the all the bases of the DNA of the, the DNA of a short, uh, bacteria. Okay? So they put this DNA of a bacteria inside an empty bacteria and this synthetic DNA evolved in a normal bacteria. It was like the first time Synthetic life was created, and I mean, and his point, the point of Venter and Company with synthetic life, is that I mean, once you are able to write code, because I mean, you can write code, this will be transformed into DNA, and this will go to life. So imagine you can write code and program life. Imagine you can write the code for a bacteria that eats shit and sheets electricity. <laughs> Why not? I mean, is if this moment arrives, maybe it's in five years, maybe it's in 10 years, it's like you can program life and create life. But I don't know when we'll see this. So this is all, but all this work as we have seen is done by a multidisciplinary consortium. Okay, so we have people from computer science, from engineering, biology, mathematics. It's done in labs from France and Spain. And we are all on, under the umbrella of the Bioemergencies platform, which was supported by European Union. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you. Um, let's get to the questions. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to bring it over. Um, can you hear me? Does that work? Can you hear me? No. Well, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> Hey. Um, yeah, you've talked a lot about the things that might be possible in the future. Uh, one of the things that interests me is uh, to what extent uh, the public might be able to participate in doing these things in the future, because this is called biohacking as well. So do you, how do you envisage the future of these technologies that you hinted to? Is it going to be happening just in academia and in the big biotech companies, or is it actually going to be possible for people from the general public or just a little bit more interested people to take part in this development and uh, in terms of democratizing science into in terms of getting science back into the hands of the people um, what do you think about uh, those prospects so an interesting question uh, the first thing is I mean this is happening in big corporations I mean this and we don't know where they are I mean the Greek Venture Institute is private and they have all the money they want and they need, and there's something is happening. In the academia, it's happening also, probably slower, and uh, more and more all the funding agencies are making compulsory to give open data, I mean all this data, 
making it public. In fact, for instance, our consortium by Emergencies, uh, we are just launching a website where we ca you can download uh, all the data sets. Okay? And uh, even we want to launch a, a kind of a crowdsourcing campaign where people that doesn't come from biology, neither from engineer, optics engineering, but for computer science and hackers, uh, we want to make a challenge so they can have the data and try to find algorithms and computer science programs in order to track each of the cells. So we, we are actively working, trying to open this to the community. And on the other hand, we have these institutions like the European Communion, Union that is making compulsory to share the data. So I think it's working very well in this direction. But it's true that as there is very out of money behind this, the big corporations are doing things that, I mean, we don't know. Even they are moving to countries with less regulations, like Singapore and things like that. Uh, do you think that creating a syn synthetic uh, bacteria will mean that in the future uh, it could be possible to create uh, artificial humans? Uh, human. Uh, this is a, <laughs> a complicated question. Uh, I mean, I think that we are very far. I mean, we are still th speaking about uh, doing uh, a bacteria, writing the code for a bacteria. But, I mean, here the limits are, I think, that are more the ethics, the ethics rather than the technology. I mean, we are cloning ships. We cloned Dolly years, years ago. We clone things. But here, the, the thing, the ethics, the ethics is the more important. I mean, we discussed that in the in the public uh, arena uh, that the technology will allow a, to clone. I guess that yes, to program. I don't know. We'll see in the future. But even now, I mean, uh, it, I think it's a proof. If you have, if your your baby is gonna have any some diseases that are gene genetically codified, you can do something. For us, so we are starting to do even genetic tests to babies to see that they are that they are okay, and if not, you can even have a treatment even for the fetus. So this, I mean, the barriers between what is ethical and what is not are not very clear. The opportunities are there, and I think that the point here is to go and do it. I mean, a step, take a step and do it for the good and show really what's going on. For instance, in the just coming back to the to the other question, uh, there is a, um, a startup which is called Symbiota which uh, are trying to open source uh, the code of synthetic life. Okay, so, so their mission is to make an open source uh, toolkit to code synthetic life. And, and there are competitions also for students, which is called GEM, that is, okay, modify, make a modify genomics and things like that. Any other questions on synthetic life? Hi. Uh, first of all, it was a great talk. My question is, um, you said you looked at the appearance of the genes uh, by... Can you speak louder? Okay, sorry. Um, you said you looked at the appearance of the genes by marking them with GFP. Um, did you look at the reactions as well? For example, with the split GFPs and then uh, looking where the reactions occur in which cells? The re reactions? Uh, uh, like like en enzymatic reactions. Did you look at that as well, or? So, um, I don't understand very well. So reactions of uh, different genes, one with the others? No, oh. of the proteins. I mean, ah, so okay. if you uh, did you code the um, the proteins with GFP as well, and then look um, if the reactions uh, occur as yeah, they where uh, where they occur. Yeah, that's yeah. so the point. And we, we tag these genes with the proteins, and when we see when they occur. Uh, the point is that uh, at this scale, which we are speaking about uh, microns, you can't go deeper, I mean, with high resolution to see in the cell what thi where things are going. Now there are a new wave of microscopes that allow allows super resolution, so you can go down to nanometers, but if you go there, you can't pick the whole embryo in the same image. So it's a question of resolution. But I mean, I hope that in the following years they will be like uh, multi-scale microscopes that allows you to see the whole picture and focus in specific places to see, I mean, proteins in the same cell or really high resolution things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions?
All right. I think we're going to let you off the hook. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you coming, uh, for coming to Berlin. Thank you. Thanks. Miguel Longo Ross.